let's uh, start our service this morning as we sing in confidence and with hope in our risen Lord Jesus. Immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Sisters, will you join with me in this prayer of thanksgiving as we say together, Gracious God, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and in human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, of the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're now uh, going to hear a, a video, a special Mother's Day video. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. No. 
And even though they love their kids to the moon and back. Mommy! Where are you going? Sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to daddy. But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. But now my only when is now and my only where is when I'm by your side. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you'd speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... but did for you as well. Let's now move into our hearing of God's word. And before we have our two Bible readings from James uh, 1 and Proverbs 10, let's focus our minds in prayer together. Thank you, Father, that all scripture we know is breathed forth by you. We know that it's useful for teaching, rebuking, for correcting, and for training us in righteousness. We pray that you would this morning Open our hearts to receive your word, that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work that you've prepared for us to do. What and we ask this through your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 13 to 32. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning but a rod for the back of one who has no sense. The wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. The wages of the righteous is life, but the earnings of the wicked are sin and death. He's disciplined shows the way to life. But whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the of their tongues. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver but the heart of the wicked is of little value. The lips of the righteous nourish men, but fools die for a lack of sense. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. A fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes, but a person of understanding lies in wisdom. What the wicked dread will overtake them. What the righteous desire will be granted. When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. As vinegar is to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are the sluggards to those who send them. The fear of the Lord adds length to life but the years of the wicked are cut short. The prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. 
The way of the Lord is a refuge for the blameless, but it is the ruin of those who do evil. The righteous will never be uprooted, but the wicked will not remain in the land. From the mouth of the righteous comes the fruit of wisdom, but a perverse tongue will be silenced. The lips of the righteous know what finds favour, but the mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. This is the word of the Lord. And our next reading is from James 1 verses 19 to 27. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Well, friends, well, welcome. Um, it's great to have you with us. Uh, we've had a few uh, technical glitches uh, this morning, but uh, we're all here and it's great to have you with us. Uh, we're continuing in our series uh, in uh, the book of James. And today, as we think about keeping it real, uh, we're going to be thinking about real listening. As we uh, think about the, the circumstances in which we find ourselves, I saw an amusing image on Facebook the other day. Uh, it kind of sums up uh, the whole kind of tension that churches might face in a post-coronavirus world. Uh, the image was of a guy uh, in church uh, after restrictions had been lifted. And uh, during the sermon, he turns to his wife and says, gosh, in the days of COVID-19 at this point, I could have just muted the guy. I wonder what, uh, what habits we've formed when it comes to how we're engaging with God's word in these strange days. It's easy to get distracted, isn't it? Uh, particularly with screen fatigue, which is a very real thing, depending on how many uh, meetings you might have had this week over Zoom. Uh, it's good to ask, how are we going engaging with God's word? What measures uh, are we putting in place to ensure that we are listening, uh, that we're responding well to what God has to say to us? Uh, the emphasis that James has in this section is on the need for action in the Christian life. Uh, God's word, his wisdom that's revealed to us for living in this world, we want to put into practice. And so we're going to look at three parts of James this morning that help us to think about what that looks like, what real listening means. And the first thing is real listening means humility instead of anger. And as you can see there, and I hope you've got your Bibles open with verse 19, comes a bit of a shift in, in topic uh, as James begins by saying, Know this, my beloved brothers. Everyone ought to be quick to listen. Uh, we're faulty listeners, aren't we, sometimes? It's, it, we're easily distracted by so much that goes on around us. Uh, our attention spans are, are a, bit, uh, a bit slower. Um, we need to show intent in our listening. Uh, and that means that we'll also be slow to speak. 
when we're quick to listen, we're slow to speak. If you've opened your mouth only to change feet as much as I have, uh, this advice can ring so true. Uh, I've never had to take back something I didn't say. Uh, easy, isn't it, to be quick even to jump to the wrong conclusions, uh, quick to judge, quick to say the worst, uh, even to get annoyed. But James is saying here that when we have listening, teachable spirit and a desire to be shaped by God's word, we'll be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. Now, that's an interesting one, isn't it? It's, it's often easy to, to rationalise anger, calling it uh, frankness or attributing it maybe to our upbringing or maybe the pressure we're under. But the Bible teaches us that anger like that is sin. Proverbs has some great advice for us. The writer says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. The anger of man doesn't bring about God's righteousness. And the link here is that since God has a specific way of life in mind for believers, James urges them, therefore, to put away all impurity, to get rid of that rampant wickedness or, or evil advantage. And instead, in meekness, receive the implanted word which is able to save our souls. And I reckon that that's a key phrase uh, for this part of James. The word here is the same as the word of truth from verse 18, which we looked at last week. And we saw how James emphasised the word's power to give new birth to believers. And here he's keen to show the ongoing responsibility to accept the word and how that plays out in day-to-day -day life. You see, God's word doesn't just give life. It also transforms life. So receiving it humbly with meekness is what enables us to, to put away impurity, to, to get rid of wickedness and and, and, and allow God's word to, to fashion us into the family likeness, which prepares us for our ultimate salvation. That's why James tells his readers to receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That doesn't mean obedience to the word wins our salvation. James wants to remind his readers that God's word isn't something we receive when we become a Christian and then we kind of just forget about it. In fact, uh, notice two things along those lines in the passage. The word is described as being implanted. So when you get something implanted, it's pretty difficult to take it out, isn't it? Taking out something that's been implanted requires a fair degree of effort. And it's the same with God's word. We want to be letting God's word be in us and, and we want to soak in it in such a way that we're letting it go deep into our hearts. Making the things that we learn so, so difficult to extract that they become just a normal part of our everyday lives. And James also says uh, about how we're to receive the word. He says it with meekness, with humility. What does that look like? What does it look like to receive the word with meekness and humility? Well, on one hand, it means not coming to the text with any kind of preconceived ideas. It means sitting under God's word and, and letting it shape us. It means praying as we come to church that God's word would dwell richly in us, praying as we approach our own personal Bible study or as you come to your small group that God would teach us his ways so that we might walk in truth and righteousness, that by his Holy Spirit we would let his words speak to our hearts. It's that wonderful Colossians 3.15 idea of letting the word of Christ dwell richly in us. It's that Hebrews 4 thing of allowing that living, active word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, to, to penetrate deeply, to, to divide soul and spirit and joints and marrow and just lay us bare. 
and asking that God would change us to live more and more like Jesus each day. Now, real listening also means doing the word. It's like that Nike slogan of the 1990s. Do you remember it? Just do it. Having talked about the words power to give new birth and our responsibility as believers to humbly embrace that word implanted in us. James now insists that receiving the word humbly also means being a doer of the word and not just a hearer. We don't want to be the kind of people for whom God's word just sort of goes in one ear and out the other. We don't want to be like that at all, do we? In fact, James gives us an illustration showing the problem of only being a hearer of the word and not a doer with the image of a person who looks in a mirror and walks away and immediately, James says, forgets what he looks like. Now, we're meant to laugh at this forgetful mirror gazer and then realise that hearing without doing what God's word says is just as silly. It's, 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 it's equally absurd. The right way of approaching God's word in contrast to the person who forgets what they look like having just looked in the mirror is to look intently, James says, into God's word and look at how he describes it there the perfect law that gives freedom. And that means working hard, persevering at understanding the scriptures, working out how it applies to our life. That's being a doer. And that person, says James, is blessed. The perfect law, it would seem, matches up against the word of truth, which gives new birth and is to be humbly accepted in our day-to-day lives. When James talks about the perfect law, he's talking about all that Jesus said and did as the one who came and fulfilled the Old Testament law. Because, you see, we know that in Jesus we're freed from that judgment of the law of Moses. And instead, because of his death on the cross in our place, we have that freedom to please our God by living the way Jesus prescribed. In fact, Jesus' own words in John chapter 8 reflect this beautifully. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So hearing and doing this law is the path of blessing, says James, which reminds us how often Jesus talks about the blessedness of obeying his teaching. You only have to look to the Sermon on the Mount, for example, to see that. It's interesting, I think, how much of James's letter has been influenced by Jesus' teaching, particularly the Sermon on the Mount. And the rest of his letter unpacks this path of blessing and obedience, specifically in the next section as he talks about what it looks like to actually do those things, how to do the law, how to obey God's word. In fact, one in 26 and 27, this is played out in what James has to say about true religion. Because true religion, James says, isn't just hearing what the Bible says. It's not just fronting up to church week in and week out. But it's taking what God's word says to us. And as we mentioned before, it's letting it penetrate deeply. And then allowing that to impact all the aspects of our day-to-day lives. So if you go back to verses 19 to 21, it means keeping a check on the things we say. Like James said earlier in this section, being slow to speak. The tongue is a huge indicator of the value we place on our religion. And James doesn't mean that if we we sometimes fall into this sin, we have a worthless religion. Uh, Controlling our words is something we all struggle with at times, isn't it? But what James is saying is that if, if anyone's tongue is habitually uncontrolled, It doesn't matter how often a person comes to church or how much of the Bible we might know or how much we pray or even how generous we might be. That person deceives themselves and his religion is worthless. The word religion here, it's used three times in these verses, but not used much at all throughout the rest of the New Testament. 
Now, we know that the term religion in our culture has quite negative connotations attached to it. But for James, it's a word covering how someone's faith is played out practically. It's all about that outward worship. You know, we can, we can carry our Bibles around and be really familiar with them. We can read the right books. We can, we can come to church regularly. We can sing the hymns and listen and give. You know, we can do all of this. A person can easily do all this but deceive themselves into thinking that they're properly and adequately religious. Our doing can actually produce a deadly religious delusion. Now, to combat that danger, James gives us three penetrating dimensions of religion which is acceptable to God. And I reckon this is a great challenge um, to people. Uh, you might even be one of these people who you think of yourself as being safely religious. But how has it played out? Well, here's what true religion, which comes from being a real listener of God's word, looks like. And I want you to notice that none of what James says here makes a person pure and faultless. He just means that these things are so important to God that he sees them as a perfect outward expression of faith. Two areas in particular that he highlights. Do you see it there? looking after those who are often overlooked in our society. That's the first one. Uh, orphans and widows were the, were, were the, under, the archetypal underprivileged. Uh, we know that they had few rights. They had little power, no status. And with no social welfare system to speak of, they were frequently impoverished. But pure religion, says James, looks after such people in an effort to ease their distress. And look after, when James says look after, it could either mean visit or care for. Uh, it seems that he's got the latter uh, in mind, since in Chapter 2, as we'll see next week, he gives a specific example of what personal involvement in meeting the needs of others looks like. He says that in verses 16 and 17 of Chapter 2. Uh, the Old Testament uh, and the early church has heaps of examples of what it looked like to do this. From collecting money for ch from churches who were ravaged by uh, famine to, to setting up daily food rosters for, for the destitute widows. You see that in Acts chapter 6. The early church was inspired by Jesus' teaching to look after those who were in need. Uh, you might have uh, noticed that we're doing a similar thing with Anglicare um, at the moment. Uh, we've, uh, we've collected a whole bunch of uh, food hampers, and I'm really grateful uh, to those amongst us who have, uh, who have supplied um, the food for these hampers. Um, there's a need in our community. And I suspect that even though there are signs of the restrictions now being eased, there are some families who are going to find getting back to some sense of normal quite a struggle, particularly if they've lost their jobs. The pure religion that comes from real listening to God's word of truth will see us look after those in distress. And it will also see believers avoiding the world's perversions. Now here James is talking about some of the socioeconomic perversions of society. And I say this because he's just given that command to look after orphans and widows. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Greek text, there's no and. Uh, in the middle of that phrase. So listen to how it reads. James says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Uh, it's interesting also that later on in chapter 4, James will talk about the world where there are clear financial overtones. He, he describes, for example, coveting wealth to spend what you get on your pleasures as being friendship with the world. It's also interesting that hot on the heels of these verses about pure religion, 
is in chapter two, a deliberate example of what it looks like to be polluted by the perversions of the world, favoring the rich over the poor. And so James insists here in verse 27 that contributing to those who are poor in our society, avoiding that, that socioeconomic pollution is an expression of our faith and a response that comes from that real listening to God's word that God finds acceptable. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with all this? Well, as I read James chapter 1, and particularly this section, what we see is that the Christian faith is a faith that works. There is a problem, isn't there, of, of hearing and learning and putting that into practice. Um, listening and memorising scripture can be viewed as a, as, as a primary act of godliness instead of a way in which God informs and nourishes us for a life of godliness. I think what we're seeing here in James is that even for us, advancing in our knowledge, though that's a good thing, isn't the goal. We want to grow in our knowledge of God because that strengthens us for a life of faith, a faith that works. But also I think as we go through these strange days, being able to preach the gospel to ourselves and remind ourselves of God's Goodness and his love and his faithfulness is also an important thing. The second thing is that while our central mission is to preach the gospel, we need to remember that Jesus' love of needy sinners should be reflected in our love of those who are in need around us. Let me finish with the words of the Apostle John. This is what John wrote. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue but with actions and in truth. We're going to sing a great song now. Uh, it's called consider Christ and the chorus is beautiful because it, it, it's that call to for God to take our lives to transform and renew and change us so that we might be living sacrifices and I think that that's a great outworking of what we've seen here in this part of James this morning so we're going to sing together now Thank you. 
Although we know that we are God's people, we know that we've been washed clean of all our sins. Scripture reminds us that we still do sin, that we are sinners. And we do need to confess our failures, acknowledge them, knowing that Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes for us with the Father. So now let's draw near to the God who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy and pray to him with sincerity and confidence as we say, Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you've washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace, that we may continue to grow as members of Christ, in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Well, we know that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Friends, let us now reflect on how great, how deep, how long, how high is God's love for us as we sing together, how deep the Father's love.
In Psalm 139, we read, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, whose blessings we receive in abundance, we thank you for the gift of our mothers. We praise you for the unique part our mothers have played in so many of our lives, bringing us to birth, nurturing us in love, guiding and teaching us in wisdom, and raising us as citizens in your world. We lift our hearts to you in thanksgiving, humbly mindful of your mercies towards us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, without whom we can do nothing good, we pray this morning for all Christian mothers, grandmothers, godmothers, in all our congregations and beyond. We pray for those who have had a, a role as a mother in our lives unofficially. Thank you, Lord, for them. Give them hearts filled with love each day and minds that are focused upon that which is most important in the midst of busyness, tiredness, heartache. Help them to fix their eyes on Jesus and find strength in him, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. And Father God, we also pray for those mothers in our community who do not know you as their heavenly father. Bring into their lives Christians who will share the truth. May they turn from living life without you and drink of that living water, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. And gracious God, you're the God of all comfort and you know our needs before we even ask them. We pray for all those whose mother, for whom Mother's Day is a time of grief and of pain. We pray for those who have lost their mothers, especially those who have recently lost their mothers. We pray for those who are caring for a mother in the midst of illness. We pray for those who have been hurt by broken relationships and by family tensions. For those couples who have longed for children yet have remained childless. In your mercy, we pray that you would comfort all these men and women. Give wisdom to those who minister to them. Help us to minister to them wisely. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you'll help them to look to you, that they will find reassurance in your love and in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And Father God, we do ask for your blessing upon our leaders both in the church and also in the political arena. We raise to you our prime minister and all the premiers of our states. We raise to you those who are giving their expert advice, their counsel in this time of COVID-19. We thank you for the leadership that has been shown. We pray that you would continue to guide them. We pray that our nation and the nations of the world will continue to respond to good advice and to good regulations. We do pray for all those who are unwell. unwell. We pray especially for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for all those who are experiencing isolation in nursing homes or at home or in hospitals. We do ask for your blessing upon all health workers and carers and those for whom social distancing is, is very difficult, if not impossible. Keep them safe. We pray for those who are suffering from lost jobs, from financial strains and difficulties. We pray, Almighty God, that you would protect our loved ones, our families and our church family from this virus and we pray Lord that you would bring an end to this pandemic sooner than even the experts are telling us is likely 
and that your name will be glorified through this. We pray that you would use this pandemic to turn people to you. We pray that through this, Lord, and through this difficulty, that you would strengthen your church throughout the world and specifically for the congregations that we're our church, that we're a part of. We pray, Lord, that we would be even more prone to listen to your word, to let it dwell within us richly and to act upon it with wisdom and insight. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to look after those who are distressed and who are in need. And we do pray that you would keep, help us to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world around us. We ask for your blessing upon the link ministries, the missionaries that we support, especially upon Martin and Lyd and the boys and Pedro and Joy and their two children in the isolation that they are experiencing. We pray especially for those that we know personally are unwell or especially suffering at this time. I personally raise up to you my brother-in-law, Stephen Robinson, Vesna's husband, Philip Bryan, and all others that we personally raise before you now. Strengthen them in their faith. Bring them relief from their suffering. And help us to minister to them and to one another. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. We now come to the singing of our final song. I pray. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart.
Friends, um, it's been so good to gather this morning. Just a couple of notices uh, that I wanted to, to let you know about, things that are happening in the life of our church. And then we've got another very short uh, Mother's Day video um, before uh, Peter closes uh, for us. Um, but uh, we started Life Explored uh, online on Thursday night over Zoom with, uh, with about five of us. Uh, it was a great night and uh, we've, uh, we've already got some interest from other people who want to join in. So if you wanted to join in with us uh, on, uh, on Thursday, this Thursday night at 7.30 uh, and you had someone you wanted to bring along as well, um, as we think about uh, life in this world and the life that God has, uh, has given us, um, we'd love for you to join us uh, in that. Um, and as I said, we've got a few more people joining us. So it's not too late, uh, even after the first week, to, uh, to come along to that. So 7.30 uh, p.m., the details are on our website and uh, there'll be a reminder email that'll go out during the week. And of course, uh, please uh, continue, if you're able, to uh, contribute towards uh, our, um, our supply of food for Anglicare's uh, Toys and Tucker. Uh, sorry, not Toys and Tucker, Anglicare, um, giving um, food to those who are in need at the moment. Um, we would, uh, we would uh, love that a lot. Uh, we've got another quick video uh, to show you this time. Uh, just some, uh, some thoughts from some, of our, uh, from some of our youth group. So some of our youth uh, wanted to express their appreciation for their mums on this Mother's Day. Uh, let's hear what some of them have to say. I am Evelyn and I appreciate my mum because she always cooks a thing when no one else wants to. I'm Rory and I appreciate my mom because she gave birth to me and she is the reason I'm living. Uh, I appreciate my mom because she is so humble, she's selfless and she always thinks about other people. I appreciate my mum because uh, she has loved me throughout the good times and the bad times as well. And uh, she's always been there to be able to talk to. Peter's gonna finish our time together this morning. and use us to love and serve you and all people. In the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please uh, do stick around on the... Uh, online morning tea following our service uh, and also or perhaps instead of once you've uh, signed off uh, call in on our video chat with someone from church uh, discuss the readings with them and the sermon with them and, and, and pray together and ask them how they're going and if there's anything that they need let us in fact be not just hearers of the word but doers as well god bless you all